Okay, um, stay focused if we can today. I know you're going to be thinking about, as Josh said, sitting with your feet in the sea and a glass of something cool with ice cubes sort of clinking in it. And don't be distracted. Don't think about those things. <laughs> stay with me. Okay, so we're going to look at something really light today, the book of Revelation. <laughs> What's that all about? What's the book of Revelation all about? It's, you know, you've got dragons and and wheels within wheels, and uh, strange things that go bump in the night, all weird stuff going on, you know. So I thought we'd take a nice light subject and look at the book of Revelation. Now, I don't pretend in any shape or form to be an expert on the book of Revelation. So um, if you're hoping to think, oh, tell me, what does this really mean? Sorry, you're going to have to go somewhere else for that today. But um, there's some things in there that, that I think that we can find as a useful tool and uh, I just want to look at, just briefly, the book of Revelation in a, uh, a quick historical context. So the book of Revelation was written um, at the end of the first century. Stay with me. This is the boring bit. Okay, stay with me. It's written at the end of the first century when the emperor Domitian was in power. Now, this emperor um, demanded that they worship Roman leaders, that they, that they worship Caesar, that they worship him. And uh, it was under Domitian that that John was boiled in oil, you know, and, and put on, on Patmos. So it gives you sort of a context of when this was happening. But so the book of Revelation, when John wrote the book of Revelation, he was writing to this persecuted church. He was writing to a church that was under extreme persecution. And not just mean, you know, they like called names and people poke their tongues out at them. I mean, they were under serious persecution. They were torn in two by horses, you know, a, a rope tied around their wrists, rope around their ankles, and then literally ripped in two, or holes drilled in their head, and molten um, lead poured in. I mean, horrendous things, dipped in tar and, and used as human torches. So they were facing some, so, sorry, not very encouraging, is it? Some severe persecution, some severe struggles. Hopefully, no one's facing that, no? Hopefully, you know, you know, no one's been tied between two horses, or I'm not making light of it, but, but what I'm saying is, is if they were facing these incredible trials, and John was writing this book to encourage them, then if we're going through some trials, and hopefully they're not to the level that these are, not that I'm belittling the things we're going through, but if we're going through struggles, then maybe what John wrote to them and encouraging them will encourage us. Does that, that make sense? You know, so what was it that caused them to go through that to go through that, because historically it's proven that actually the church grew in that time. It was strengthened in that time as they were facing that persecution, as they were facing death, you know, at, at the lions or whatever it was, that the church became stronger and grew and expanded. So what is it? What is it that, that John wrote that, that we can take away? And, and as we go through these struggles of life, these, these challenges, what is it that we can take encouragement from and not give up on our faith and not just cast it aside when things get tough because we can do that. We can be guilty of doing that. Just like the early church could have said, okay, you know, it's just not worth dying for, so I'll, I'll back off. So what is it that, that we can grow stronger in our faith through those things? Well, uh, Revelation 1, Revelation 21, and Revelation 22 has a reoccurring message in it. There's a reoccurring phrase. And in Revelation 1 verse 8, it says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. I am the Almighty. That phrase, I am the Alpha and the Omega. So John is basically saying, if you can learn to see God as your Alpha and the Omega, as the Alpha and the Omega, then you can go through anything. You can face anything. You think, oh, well, that, that's great, Simon, thanks. I'll just sit down now and we can just take that away. You know, what, do, what does that even mean? What, how does that help? How does that help to see God as the Alpha and the Omega? How is knowing that, because you've all read it so many times, how is knowing that going to help us? And that's what I want to look at today, if that's okay. So we're just going to very briefly look at the Alpha, but really, as you can see, I'm going to concentrate on the Omega. But we're going to just briefly take a quick, quick look at the Alpha. Maybe we'll look at that another time in more detail. But, so what does it mean to have God as the Alpha? Well, God is the start point. He is the beginning. He is the very, the Alpha and Omega, are the, 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 the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. But he's not talking about the Greek alphabet. He's talking about God being the beginning. And you have to start with God. You can't start with you. 
You can't start with you. Because if you start with you, then you're just a, a bunch of random molecules that came together by accident, and then everything else happens by accident. If you start with you, it doesn't, it's not encouraging. You won't find any help. You'll find any hope, because it's all about you. But scripture doesn't start with you and I, does it? It starts with someone who exists outside of time, who always was. And we can't talk about that this morning, because that's a massive subject. But God always was. He is the Alpha. He was before things. And we have to step outside of ourself to be able to see who we are. That sounds really deep, doesn't it, on a Sunday morning? We have to step outside of ourselves. It's like seeing a painting, you know, an amazing painting. I don't know if you've ever been to, like, the, the Royal uh, uh, Galleries in London. Um, what's the word I'm thinking of? The Portrait Gallery? Yeah, yeah. These beautiful galleries and these beautiful paintings. And if you stand right up next to the painting... You think, well, it's just a load of like gooey lumps of oil paint, right? But the further you step back and you take it in, the, the picture becomes the sort of solidify and you see this amazing landscape, don't you? And the further back you go, the, the clearer it comes. And it's like that. We have to step back and we have to see ourselves within the context of who God made us. That God has a plan, that he has a purpose, that we are not an accident. Amen. He is the Alpha. He is the beginning. He is the very start of all things. He's the, the yeah, he's the beginning. We, and if we step back and we see ourselves within that context, we see, wow, God created me for a purpose. Amen? You with me? Or you're on that beach at the moment. You with me? Yeah. We're not going to hang around the Alpha for a minute. We're going to go to the Omega. But just, just bear that in mind, okay, as we, as we look at the, as the Omega. But like I said, I want to concentrate on the Omega. But but don't ignore the alpha side of things. Maybe we'll come back to that at some point. So I want to read to you something by a great preacher, a chap called John Piper, um, and he wrote this. He says, in Revelation 21.6, God identifies himself as the alpha and the omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. In other words, God is the beginning and the end. But God isn't speaking about alphabets. He's speaking about reality. God is absolutely the beginning and absolutely the end. Everything that originates ultimately in him and everything will somehow end with him. Isaiah puts it like this. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. In other words, since everything comes from God and nothing will outlast God, therefore God has no final competitors. Besides me, there is no God. God has the first word and the last word in history. All other attempts to have the last word will fail. I like that. The, potter, the pottery has no beginning apart from the potter. And in the end, it will serve the purpose of the potter. Can you see that? So God is the ultimate. He, the universe, all of creation, all of eternity was made by him for him. It will culminate in him. We are heading towards God. He was the beginning, yet we're heading towards him. I know this is deep this morning. I told you it's going to be deep. But maybe that doesn't help. Maybe you think, yeah, that doesn't really help me, actually. You're saying that doesn't really help me face my problems. It doesn't really help me go through anything. We'll get there. Stay with me. So he is the omega point. He's the point that everything is heading towards. Hence the title. Clever, right? Eh? He is the omega point. He is the point that our lives are heading towards. He is the point. He has to be the point of our lives. He has to be the point of our life. He's in charge of history and all of history is heading towards him. All of our lives, all that we go through, all the things that we endure, all of the things that we enjoy, all the things that we walk through are heading towards one point and that is God. He is the omega point. You think, yeah, that's great, but it still doesn't help me. Stay with me, okay? Stay with me. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For as many as are the promises of God, they all find their yes and amen, or their answer, in Christ. So everything you need will be met in him someday. All of your desires will be met in him someday. All of your problems will be resolved in him someday. This is a quote that says, All history is running headlong into his lap. Everything, all of our problems, I'm not saying they'll be met now, but someday 
all of the things that we desire, all of the, the, the hurts that humanity is going through, all of the pains and the suffering of this world, someday will be rectified in God. Maybe now, maybe in eternity, but God has a plan that when, we, when all of history comes to an end, God will have resolved all of those things in him. Amen? Come on, that's good news. Yeah, amen. That's good news, that at the end of history, God will have resolved all things. And these are massive truths, okay? And they are huge truths. They're huge doctrinal thoughts and ideas. But I want to put this into a package that you can take away, and you can use this every day. Okay, so what does all of that mean, simply put? It means this, that Jesus must be your omega point. He must be the point. He must be the point of your life. Jesus must be your point. And put it another way. There's a great quote by the, the late Dr. Timothy Keller, preacher I really loved listening to, passed away just a couple of weeks ago. He said this, and listen to this because this is key this morning. If you're still thinking about that, that, that cold lemonade by the sea, just come back in the room for a minute and, and stay with me. I'm probably making it worse saying that, aren't I? It says, there are only two ways to approach God. You can either make him the means and something else the end, or you can make him the end and everything else the means. Let me say that again. There are only two ways to approach God. You can either make him the means and something else the end, or you can make him the end and everything else the means. In other words, we come to God, right, either for God, or for God to give us something else. Does that make sense? But you can't do that. You can't make God the means and have something else as the end, because God is the omega point. God is the omega point. You can't use him as a way to get the things that you want. You can't use, you can't add, you say, well, really, my life isn't going so well, my marriage isn't working so well, my finances aren't so good, I don't feel well, I've got this going on in my body, I've got this going on at work, so if I come to God, if I come to Christ, he will help me resolve those things. And then, 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 I'll be happy, right? That's not the way it works. God is the omega point. You can't use him as a means to an end. You're getting this. And this is exactly what the early church were facing, right? This is exactly what they were going through. So in his message, The Cosmic King, uh, Tim Keller states that in, in the very beginning, we almost all approach God not to make him our omega point. We approach him and try to turn him into a means to reach the omega points that we're not getting to. To reach the omega points that we're not getting to. What are your omega points? What are they? What are they? Is it, is it ministry? It could be an omega point. Is it health? Is it wealth? Is it relationships? Is it promotions at work? Is it problems with the family? Are those your omega points? What are your omega points? Your omega points are the non-negotiables. The things that if you don't have them, then life has no point. It's pointless. If I don't have that, then life is pointless. If I don't have that relationship, then life is pointless. If I don't have that job, then life is pointless. If I don't have that car, if I don't have that, that circumstances resolved, if I don't have that, that, that relationship, whatever it may be, if I don't have that, then life is pointless. And those are our omega points. Those are the things that we're, that we're aiming towards, that we're, and we're asking God, get me there. Get me to my omega point. Right? Can you see that? You see what I'm saying? Okay. So our life can feel like it's falling apart because we're not getting these things. It's just we're not getting the things that we, we want. We're not getting the things that we think we need. We're not getting them. So our life feels like it's falling apart. We're not getting to the point. The things that we value, we're not getting to. We're, we're not reaching them. We're not getting there. And so we turn to God and we say, God, God, please help me get to these points. And so maybe we think Christianity will help with those things, that God will help us to get those things. Things that you think, oh, yeah, this is going this morning. This isn't very encouraging at all. But stay with me. Okay. So what difference does it make seeing God as our omega point? Well, 
you, you can be sitting next to someone in church and you can think you've got exactly the same religion as them, exactly the same outlook on life. But if your omega points are different, if God is either the means or the end, your, your religion, your walk with God will have a completely different play out to it. Right? You'll either be frustrated or content. Yeah? You will. You'll either be working and trying and struggling and disappointed or you'll be happy. It, it will be a, a, a religion of works or a religion of rest, depending on whether God is your omega point or whether he's your means of getting to an omega point. It will affect our whole religion and, and, and what we believe, and I mean religion in a good way, you know, it will affect our whole outlook, our whole expectancy, our whole faith. And I'm sure that, that some of us have God as our omega point and some of us have other things. And this whole auditorium is full of different people with different omega points, with different frustrations, with different desires, with different needs. But if God is our omega point, then we'll be at rest. And remember, this is written to a church that was facing persecution that was facing struggles, that was facing trials. So I just want to read this quote to you. It says, I have done everything that I'm supposed to do. I have prayed, I've asked, I've given, I've worked my fingers to the bone, I've studied, I've stayed, and I still don't have what I want. I still don't have what you said you give me, God. What is the point of Christianity? What is the point of my relationship with you? It doesn't work. Are you at that point? I have prayed. I have believed. I have given. I have fasted. I have told the truth. I have done this. I have believed that. I've read that book. I've, I've come to church every Sunday for the last 30 years. I have done it. And look at the state of things. Look where I am. And can you imagine an early, the early church saying that? Look, I have, I have confessed to you before, before this um, Emperor Domitian, I have, I have confessed to you, I have not backed down, I have not given up, I have not, I have not backed away, I have done everything you said I should do, God, and here I am, I've got my head in a lion's mouth. <laughs> Look where obeying you got me. You ever feel that? Look, I, I told the truth at work. I was honest in a meeting. I, I, I tithed. I gave, and look at the situation now. Look at the circumstances. Lord, I have obeyed you. I, I've done everything that you told me to do, and look where it got me. I got nothing. In fact, I'm worse off than I was before. You ever had those conversations with God? Yeah? Look, I'm, I'm sick. I've done everything, God. I've believed it. I've trusted you. My family don't believe in you, but I believe in you, and look where it got me. Shall we just end it there, and then we'll go home? No, we'll keep going. Okay. So when we say that, effectively what we're saying is that we've made serving God the means and our desire the end. And when we find that we're not getting what we want, life becomes pointless. Just connecting those two things together. We're saying, God, you are the means. So I came to you for these things. That, that's, this is exposing what your omega point is. I came to you, God, and I did everything, but I didn't get what I wanted. And I'm now prepared, I'm, I'm, it's, what's the point? What's the point in following God? I'm just going to throw it all away now because there's no point. I'm not getting what I wanted. But God says, well, that was never the deal in the first place. I am the omega point, not me, God. God says, I am the omega point. I am enough. Well, I, can you imagine? Jesus is standing there before you and he says, oh, I'm really sorry. Yeah, you only get me. <laughs> you only get me. Sorry. You know, yeah, you don't get the car. You don't get the girl. You don't get the holiday, you just get me. Sorry about that. You just get God. You just get the Alpha and the Omega. You just get the one who was and is and is to come. You just get the Father of all creation. That's all you get, but you don't get the bank balance. You don't get the healing. You don't get the promotion. And we say, yeah, God, well, without those things, it's no point. It's no point. It's not, it's not a deal. But God has to be the omega point. If we don't, I'm not saying that God won't do those things, hear me. I'm not saying that God doesn't heal and doesn't provide and doesn't bless. I'm not saying those because we know that he does, right? So don't think that's what I'm saying because that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is what, when those, what happens when those things don't happen? 
And we've all experienced that. You know, I don't know anyone who's had a 100% success rate on prayer. I don't know anyone, you know, pray for this, get it, pray for this, get it, pray for this, get it. It doesn't work that way, does it? It doesn't work that way. Sometimes, yeah, excuse me, God blesses us with the things we ask for, and we keep on asking him, and he doesn't sometimes. And what do we do then? I mean, these, the early church, did they want the same things that we want? Yes. Did they want to have me ripped apart by wild horses? I'm going to guess no. Did they want to have holes drilled in their head and molten lead poured in? No. Did they want time with their family? Did they want health? Did they want prosperity? Did they want to be able to worship with other believers? Yes, they did want those things. But knowing that God was their omega point and not those things is what took them through. Knowing that he is the reward. He was enough. I'll give you an example, trying to put this into context. Imagine that you are, you know, you're standing on the side of the road somewhere and you see someone, you know, they're not paying attention, they're on their phone, you never see that, do you? On their phone, and they just step out in front of a, of a speeding truck, right? And you, you, as the superhero that you are, you run across and you, you dive and you grab them out of the way and you both fall onto the grass verge and you save them. Well done, you save them. And the person stands up and they say, well, thank you so much for serving me. Thank you so much for that. And you look down and you've ripped your jeans. And you say, well, I don't know what good it did me because, look, I've ripped my jeans. Goes, but, but thank you for serving me. You saved my life. Yeah, but look at the stain on my jeans. What is that person going to think? There's only one conclusion that they can draw, isn't there? That your jeans are worth more than their life. And this is what we do. Yeah, God, I served you. And what good did it do me? What good did it do me? I, I told the truth and I got fired. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I loved and I forgave and they just kept on abusing me. I believed for healing and it didn't happen. What good does it do me? Look, I ripped my jeans. What, what conclusion would God draw? Well, why were you serving me in the first place? Why were you serving me in the first place? Were you serving me for you? Were you serving me for what you could get? Were you serving me for what I could give you? Or were you serving me for me? Am I enough? Am I sufficient for you? Am I, do I tick the boxes for you? Am I enough? Am I the omega point? And that's a question when I, I heard this message the first time and, and read into it. I have to question, for me, is he my omega point? Or is he my means to get? to my omega points, the things that I'm not getting to. And those things can be very spiritual. They can seem that. Now, ministry, we, we went through this years ago, you know, we, wanted, yeah, we were told we were going to pastor and everything else and, and you know, and, and prayed and prayed and prayed and didn't get to those things and got very frustrated about it. Why? Because God wasn't the omega point. Ministry was. God isn't the omega point. Healing is. You know, maybe some of you have struggled with long-term illness for, you know, for a long time. Long time, yeah. <laughs> Short-term illness for a long time. Maybe you struggled with that. And we, we, you know, we shake our fist at God. God, I've obeyed you. I've done everything. I've done everything. I've done everything you told me to do. I've held my confession. Where did it get me? Where has it got me, God, obeying you? Where has it got me? And God says, well, it's got, it's got you, me. It's got you, me. We are one now. Eternity is secure. You will spend all eternity with me. Yeah, but what about this, God? What about the omega points that, that I want? And God again says, but those, those were never part of the deal. It shouldn't need to be, right? It shouldn't need to be an incentive. I completely lost my place now. Um, okay, I want to read to you uh, just a, a short bit of scripture here or a short excerpt from something written about Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot was the husband of Jim, uh, sorry, the wife of Jim Elliot, who was uh, a missionary in 1956 to the Orca Indians in the eastern Ecuador and Jim Elliot was killed. Okay, and, and uh, Elizabeth Elliot, Elliot wrote a book called No Graven Image. And in the novel, the main character, who was faithfully a missionary attempted to translate the Bible into an unwritten tribal language, sees her entire life's work destroyed. And in the end, she says this. So it's a novel. She says this. She says, Now, in the clear light of day, I see that God, if he was merely my accomplice, 
he had betrayed me. If, on the other hand, he was God, he had freed me. And then the person goes on to say this, if God is our means and something else is our ends, we are engaging in idolatry. An idol is anything that captures our vision or our affections more than Christ. It doesn't matter if that something is pleasure, wealth, family or ministry. Success, it is an idol. If God is our accomplice, he is a means to some other end. If he is our God, he is the end and everything else is the means. And because we are created by God and for God, ultimately it is only when God is our end that we experience the true joy and fulfillment. John Piper's book, The Pursuit of Pleasure in God, instead of pursuit of pleasure in things from God, is just as true today. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. But if God is our accomplice, no matter how righteous the pursuit is, we are not being satisfied in God. It is only when God is our ends that we are seeking fulfillment in him. And it's only then that we are operating as we were created to. And Jim Elliot, who was Elizabeth Elliot's husband, who got killed by the orcas, he had said this, it's an amazing quote. He said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. In other words, all of this stuff is temporary, right? All of this stuff, all the things that are our omega points, they are temporary. Even if we are healed today, we're going to die. You know, no one gets out without dying. You know, 100% of people die. Sorry. So, really? Yeah. So I spoiled the ending for you. But ultimately, God is good. We get God. We get God. In fact, we don't get God. You've got God. You've got him now. The fullness. We have received the fullness of who we are in Christ. Now, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know when that trial will end, if it will end in this life or if it will end when we reach the end of this life. I don't know. Hopefully it will end soon. But if that seeing that trial end is your omega point, you're going to be disappointed. Because after you got through that trial, you know what? It's going to be another one. <laughs> Sorry. It's going to be another one. But God will never disappoint. He is more than our hearts could comprehend. He is more than we could ever hope for, imagine, or believe for. He is God. He is the fulfillment of the promise. He is the yes and amen. He is. He is. And he needs to be our omega point. I want to read to you from the book of Hebrews 11.35 in closing. It says this, there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute and persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what they had been promised. Wow. Wow. Let's let that sink in a minute. This is talking about the same church that, that John was writing to in Revelation. None of them received what they had promised. Thinking, oh man, that's not encouraging, is it? I'm not going to get what God promised me. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that the book of Hebrews refers to them as the heroes of faith. Right? Why? Because their omega point was not these things. It was not being free of the suffering. It was not being free of the struggles. It was not getting what they wanted. It was not an easy life. That was not their omega point. What was their omega point? It says, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us, they would be made perfect. In other words, we, we're going to get it. We're going to get it all in God. Amen? If he's the omega point. We're going to be satisfied 
in him. And here's the good thing. Here's the, here's the, the icing on the cake, right? If, if you make something else your omega point and God the means, you get neither. Right? But if you make God the omega point, if you make God the omega point and something else the means, you get both. You get both. Because ultimately, we know that in him, we are made whole. In him, he's the yes and amen. All of our promises are fulfilled in God. At the end, at the end, all of them are fulfilled in God. So, yes, you can have those things, you can want those desires, but if you make him the focus, if you make him the omega point, you get all of those things anyway. But if you make those things the focus, and you use God, and that's what we're doing, we're using God, to get us those things, you get neither. I know which one I want to choose. So th this morning, you know, I said, you know, how do we apply this? It's really, it's incredibly simple and incredibly complicated at the same time. How do we apply it? Ask yourself the question, what are my omega points? What were the omega points of those Christians in those stadiums? Colosseums where they were being attacked by lions. What were their omega points? What were they? Was it the latest phone? Was it a promotion at work? Was it, you know, I hope the kids get into uni? What were their omega points? What were they? You can see, right? Because where they are, they're in, in, they're in there with the lions, right? They're in there being pulled between two horses. What were their omega points? God, he was enough. He was, and not just, because you know, as we're saying this, you can almost hear the cog like clinking, yeah, yeah, I know, but yeah, but what about now? Yeah, so I, yeah, that's all kind of in the future, in this mystical realm, God is enough. It can't be that way. God has to, the reality of who God is has to be something that you hold on to. It's real. It's real. It's not just something that will happen in the sweet by and by. God is real. You are loved and prized and cherished by God. You are the apple of his eye. He was the one who left the throne of glory to die for you. Yeah? He is the one who, who loves you with a passion that would hold him to the cross. You are precious to him. It is real. It is real. Make him the omega point. Live for him. Let him be the focus. Let him be the point of your life. And if that is the point, if he is the point, all of these things, whether you get them or whether you don't get them, they won't. Yeah, you, you might be disappointed, but you won't fall away from the faith. You won't turn away. You won't turn back. You'll grow stronger. Amen? Quick story. Sorry, Janet. Keep going. I've, I've shared this story before, or an illustration before, but I think it paints a good picture. Imagine that you go on board an aeroplane, and I'm sorry if you've heard this before, but it makes a good point. You go on board an aeroplane, and when you get on board that aeroplane, they give you a parachute. It's always a bit worrying. They give you a parachute, okay? So it's an airliner, and you strap the parachute on, and it's, you know, maybe one of those ones you used to get, show my age now, when the air cadets sit in a chipmunk with a parachute strapped to your bottom and you can't walk properly. But they give you this parachute, right? And they say to you, the parachute will improve the journey experience, okay? It's going to make it comfortable. You're going to enjoy it. And so you get on the plane, and it takes off, and it's uncomfortable, right? The strap's digging in. You can't move properly. The air hostess brings around tea and coffee, and you can't even reach for it. And you spill it on yourself, and everyone's laughing at you and pointing at you. And everything. So eventually you think, oh, I'm not wearing this, and you take it off, right? Now, imagine if someone tells you something different when they give you the parachute. They say, okay, when this aircraft reaches 12,000 feet, the wing's going to come off, right? You're the only person with a parachute, right? When you get on the plane, it's still the same. It's still uncomfortable. The straps are still digging in. You still can't get the coffee. But what happens? You hold on even tighter to the parachute, right? Because you have the, your expectancy is right. It's not about life improvement on the journey. It's about, okay, uh, this is the, it's about the end, right? Or making the end a bit further away. It's, that's what it's about. And Christianity is like that. If someone tells you this is about life improvement, right? This is about this is about your omega points being fulfilled. This is about having all of your needs met, all of your ailments healed, all of the 
things rectified, all the bumps taken out of the road. That's what Christianity is about. You put it on, it takes not going to be very long before you take it off again. Because it, it doesn't work, does it? Because there are still bumps in the road. There are still problems. There are still issues. There are still needs that aren't being met. They're still there. But if, you, if someone tells you, look, this is your future, it's your hope, it's the certainty of life eternally spent with God. It's fulfillment in the Father. It's knowing that you are loved no matter what, that you are cared for, and that for all eternity you will reign with Him. You will hold on to it even tighter. You will hold on to your faith. Just like those early Christians did in those, those Colosseums, where they're, well, the Colosseums, whatever, those, those, those places where they were being ripped apart. You will hold on to it. You won't give up your confession. You will hold on to it. And that's what I'm talking about this morning. Shall we stand together? Amen. Our God is great. Amen. He's given us exceedingly great promises beyond our comprehension. He is good. Please don't take away from this morning that oh, I'm not going to get what I want. So that's, you know, that wasn't very encouraging. That's not the takeaway this morning. Yes, God will work and move mountains to bless us. He will. He'll move mountains to heal us. He will do the impossible to get us where we need to be and to fulfill our purpose in Him. But how we live is to keep our eyes fixed on the Omega point. Amen. Have a great day. Have a blessed uh, week. And we'll see you on Wednesday night.